point. To date, we have not received any representation from PERC in relation to their particular powers. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 13404 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the EU referendum. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to move the motion cabinet secretary 13 minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, Scotland has been a positive and integral part of the European Union for over 40 years. Engagement with the European Union and its institutions has been and will remain a core priority for this government. But we now stand near a crossroads. The outcome of the general election has resulted in the publication of a UK referendum bill, which lays the ground for an in-out referendum uh, in the UK before the end of 2017. And whilst the Scottish Government made clear in the run-up to the general election that we did not support a referendum, a referendum is now a reality and we must deal with it. Presiding officer, the Westminster Parliament is debating the second reading of the draft referendum bill today. Uh, it fails to meet the gold standard of the independence referendum in regards to the proposed franchise on reform. This SNP government set out our views uh, in Scotland's agenda for EU reform, published on the 20th of August 2014, and these can be achieved, achieved without treaty change. Presiding officer, we will make the positive case of the benefits of EU membership and what it brings to Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK, why it is vital that this membership continues and why it is incumbent on all of us to make the case for continued EU membership as a referendum approaches. This chamber has debated the importance of EU membership on a number of occasions with a strong consensus that continued EU membership matters to Scotland. As the in-out referendum is now an inevitability, we must continue to spell out the case for Scotland's EU membership going forward. And in making the positive case, we will ensure the facts are set out to tackle head-on the unfounded fears and smears of those who want to see an EU exit as they present them from a narrow isolationist position. The First Minister was in Brussels last week and set out Scotland's commitment to the EU in a speech to the European Policy Centre. To the uh, First Minister's argument of that uh, was that membership was this. As, as a country of five million people, we understand that we cannot act in isolation. Partnership between independent states is essential for progress. And so the fundamental vision of the EU of independent nations working together for a common good appeals to us. And cooperation is critical to success in the EU. In many areas, delivering the greater good can only be successful when 28 member states act together. It seems hopelessly optimistic to conclude that member states acting alone could deliver significant emissions reductions in the fight against climate change or take forward plans to develop a North Sea's grid that will one day allow countries bordering the North Sea to trade renewable energy. And the EU must look outward and act globally, or Europe will become the old continent of the past when the rest of the world moves on without it. Of course, the immediate economic arguments supporting membership remain critical and cannot be overstated. Membership places our businesses within the world's largest economy, whose 500 million citizens enjoy some of the highest standards of living on the globe. Around 20 million businesses operate in the EU single market, supplying goods and services to consumers and businesses both in the EU and on the global market. And the EU is a vital export market for Scottish firms, accounting for almost half of Scotland's international exports in 2013, worth a massive £12.9 billion each year. And it has been estimated that those exports support more than 300,000 jobs. Ernst & Young published a survey last month which confirmed that Scotland has become the most successful part of the UK outside of London for attracting inward investment projects. And much of that is due to the skills of our workforce and the quality of life that we can offer. But for many investors, our EU membership is a vital selling point. Around 40% of the 2,100 foreign-owned companies in Scotland in 2013 were owned by firms based in the EU. And how many of those investors would realistically come to Scotland if we were to find ourselves outside of the EU? And let's not forget the benefits that EU funding delivers to Scotland, including the 985 million euros of structural funds over the period 2014 to 2020, or the 572 million euros worth of competitive funding won by Scottish universities in the period 2007 to 2013. 
However, membership of the EU goes beyond the purely economic rationale. The experience of the EU and our vision for the EU is one which we can create in which we can create a more equal and more inclusive society. The Scottish Government believes strongly in a Europe that tackles the question of social justice. And the EU has been at the forefront of protecting the welfare of its citizens, promoting gender equality, improved conditions for workers and strengthening consumer rights. That is the type of EU we must continue to develop. A European Union of members who embrace and promote human rights through the Convention rather than dismiss them or seek to refute them. A vision of a Europe that deals collectively with humanitarian issues like Mediterranean refugees with compassion, not hostility. And I also welcome the social and cultural and economic benefits that migration from the EU delivers to Scotland's communities. The right to freedom of movement is also of huge benefit to Scots who move to live, study and work elsewhere in the EU. And we estimate that 171,000 people born elsewhere in the EU currently live in Scotland. And contrary to the claims once here, here's elsewhere about immigration acting as a drain on our society, it is estimated by the University College London that EU migrants to the UK made a net contribution to the UK of around £20 billion pounds between 2001 and 2011. And that loss of income would cost all of us. And by being a productive EU member, we can ensure our voice is clearly heard in the world and that we are able to shape EU laws and policies to ensure they are of maximum benefit to our citizens. Alternatives to EU membership, such as joining EFTA, offer no such opportunity for the UK transforming its status from a lawmaker into a mere law taker. And as the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs highlighted in a recent interview uh, a matter of days ago, in the EEA we have to implement all EU directives. We're not around the table when they're discussed in Brussels. None of us here today will be able to vote to amend the actual referendum bill, but that shouldn't stop us expressing our views on it, particularly where it falls short of expectations. The Scottish Government believes it falls short in a number of areas. The 16 and 17 year olds who voted in our referendum uh, proved themselves to be the engaged, thoughtful, concerned citizens we always knew they would be. The case for letting them vote in the EU referendum is overwhelming. Indeed. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that Dr Sarah Wollaston, who is the MP for Totnes in South Devon in this morning's debate, advocated precisely that point? She is, of course, a conservative, senior Conservative Chair of Committee. I am very uh, grateful for the member and pleased to hear about that intervention because I think this is a case that can and should be won. And I think a united voice from this parliament uh, advocating votes in 16 and 70 years complimenting those, from, uh, those in, in Westminster from a number of parties will be very important uh, as this bill progresses. And, presiding officer, 171,000 EU citizens live in Scotland. EU citizens can vote in Scottish parliamentary and local government elections, and they were able to vote in the independence referendum, something on which all parties in this parliament agreed. And they have chosen to make Scotland their home, and the case for extending the vote to them in the EU referendum is strong. They should have a voice in the issues that affect our country, and I don't understand why the UK government is proposing to grant the right to the citizens of three other EU countries living in the UK, Ireland, Malta and Cyprus, but not the remaining 24. The polls have consistently shown that people in Scotland have a more favourable attitude to the EU relative to their English counterparts. That is why the Scottish Government will argue for a double majority, a double lock provision in the bill, where the UK can only leave the EU if each constituent part of it votes to leave. That sort of territorial requirement is not unique. It is used in some federal states, such as Canada or Australia, and this should apply in this instance to this EU referendum bill. Indeed. Um, can I ask her if Scotland uh, votes no, but the rest of the UK votes yes, how will double majority work in that instance? Well, I don't think Scotland will vote no. Indeed, uh, if you look at the opinion polls, it's well in advance. And... Uh, uh, presiding officer, as long as there are no health and safety issues and the Conservatives are, uh, are perfectly all right, I plan to continue. <laughs> uh, on timing. Uh, 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 Fraser. Uh, to, the, to the Cabinet Secretary for giving me, just on this issue of double majority, by the same logic, 
Why were the people of Orkney and Shetland not given a veto during the independence referendum last year? I, th I think the uh, people of Orkney and Shetland have, have their own issues currently with the current MP in relation to concerns in Orkney and Shetland. But the point is this is about a national referendum in relation to the independence referendum. It's a point about our future within the European Union. And, and I think the provisions, as were perfectly agreed to, indeed I think Murdo Fraser argued this point, I didn't see him putting forward a double majority in that instance when the legislation for our referendum was going through. On timing, uh, presiding officer, no, no, on, t on timing, no date has yet been set, but it is imperative that a referendum avoids the Scottish parliamentary and local elections in May 2016 and May 2017. And I hope that's something that, should a date be, be set that we disagree with, we can get consensus in this place. The Scottish. If I want to pr pursue some points on the re reform agenda. The Scottish Government has never argued that the EU is perfect and we set out suggestions in Scotland's agenda for EU reform. The institutions of the EU have grown uh, distant from the citizens. Uh, there is indeed uh, for those uh, institutions a need for those institutions to reconnect. We have identified two main ways in which it can contribute to this. Firstly, by influencing the renewed EU institutions to pursue further regulatory reform so that EU regulation is more proportionate, consistent, accountable, transparent and targeted, for example by implementing the agreed CFP reforms to decentralise fisheries management, and secondly by influencing the renewed EU institutions to prioritise economic and social policies which reflect the fundamental aspirations and concerns of its citizens. The EU must address international problems that member states acting alone could not to promote energy security through the energy union package and to complete the digital single market, to tackle climate change collectively, growth and competitiveness, which is sustainable and experienced by all citizens of the EU and collective action on youth employment. EU law to enable procurement practices, which would require the living wage to be paid, and EU law and policy to facilitate and encourage member states to take action to combat the causes of ill health. And these sort of reforms are about doing things better and in a smarter way. They're also about uh, pursuing a continuous improvement agenda, changing the way the EU works as it expands and circumstances change. And I believe that existing treaty structures can accommodate this. However, the Prime Minister said that he wants to renegotiate the UK's, UK's relationship with Europe. It's far from clear what he actually wants or indeed whether his proposals will require treaty change. David Cameron seems to be neither clear nor from yesterday in control. Mm. A word of warning. We shouldn't cast the forthcoming negotiations between the UK and other member states in terms of there being winners and losers. The whole point about a more effective European Union is that everyone should gain from it. Compromise does not, in my view, mean concession. And a second warning is we remain concerned about UK government's rhetoric in some quarters, which creates the impression that EU membership is not beneficial at present and will only become beneficial if we achieve big enough reforms. And that approach makes it harder to articulate the benefits we already gain from membership. And there is a real danger the UK will focus the EU debate on a narrow agenda on the success or otherwise of the Prime Minister's negotiations, rather than the bigger picture of the value and importance of the EU. Remember, it is the overall position which will be the decision on the ballot, and we must conduct the debate of EU membership with the bigger picture in mind. In closing, presiding officer, I believe the, the best way to tell the positive story of EU membership is to tell the individual stories of its people, the businesses and the sectors which benefit right now. And I call on the members of this parliament to help make the positive case for EU membership to the Scottish people and indeed to those throughout these islands. And I move the motion in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 13404.4. Ms Baker, nine minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be part of this debate this afternoon. It's not that long since we had a debate on Europe, but this one takes part in very different circumstances. We now have a majority Conservative government, and we will have an in-out EU referendum by the end of 2017. Um, the UK Parliament is having the second reading of the bill today as we have this debate and I do accept there is legislation to be passed and there needs to be debate to be had over the terms of that referendum. But we do have a majority Conservative government in the early days of its government and they are in a position to decide the terms of this referendum. 
Uh, we support changing the UK franchise to provide votes for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, the school debates during the referendum that I took part in were some of the most informed and well conducted debates and young people showed a real level of interest and knowledge that endorsed the decision to extend the franchise. Uh, we support the franchise reflecting the franchise for the Scottish Parliament, which would include EU citizens resident in the UK. Um, Labour's amendment also raises concerns about the date of any referendum. The EU referendum should take place within its own space. But we cannot allow the debate over process to dominate the public debate. The outcome of the referendum here in Scotland or anywhere else across the UK is not guaranteed. Um, these are the early days of the debate and there are and those of us who support continued membership must convincingly win that argument. We cannot ignore that there are a range of views in Scotland. We do have a UKIP MEP elected to represent Scotland. And there will be many who come to this debate with a fairly open mind, looking to understand the arguments and be persuaded one way or the other. There is a long way to go with the electorate, and it would be naive in Scotland to assume that we know the outcome. We cannot ignore that while there are many positive reasons to remain in the EU, some of those outlined by the Cabinet Secretary and by the First Minister in Brussels last week, and I'll talk a bit more about these advantages this afternoon, there will be arguments across the political and social spectrum that the EU is not working for Scotland, from concerns around business regulations to the campaign opposing TTIP and the political direction of the EU, and those concerns need to be addressed in the debate. Because the EU, as well as being a social, economic, cultural and educational union, is also a political animal. All parties who support continued membership are also talking about reform. Um, but I would argue you need to remain a member to achieve that reform. We are seeing huge economic challenges across Europe. Um, we are seeing young people who are finding it difficult to find employment. Uh, we can see the social divide widening. Many economies are facing levels of poverty that they have not experienced for generations. And from social problems, community tensions, pressure on public services and workers' rights, through to rising concerns over tax avoidance and the implications of future trade deals. And for too many people, the Europe, the Parliament, the Commission, the Council of Ministers does not look like it is adequately responding. Often it is bureaucratic, slow to respond, inflexible and driven from the centre. So greater effort must be made to reform the Commission and its bureaucracy, the Parliament and its accountability, and the economic model of the Eurozone, which for too many economies is imbalanced. But this challenge can only be met from within, not by threats to leave. I would argue that the economic benefits of membership are hugely important to the Scottish economy. Um, across the UK, 200,000 companies direct the benefit from EU membership, while £200 billion of annual exports and £450 billion of inward investment are all tied to trade with our partners. Some 336,000 jobs are dependent on these relationships. And in Scotland, we benefit from a single market of over 500 million consumers with Scottish exports to the UK accounting for almost 50% of total international exports. Our economy also benefits from freedom of movement and the EU members who choose to come and live and work in Scotland. Migration brings huge benefits to our country. Migrants contribute more to the economy than they use and many businesses I speak to in the food sector, the agricultural sector, the textile sector, as well as our health sector and services couldn't operate without employees from the EU member states. That is a fact of our economy and of who we are. But this debate cannot only be about the economy. This debate can't just be about economics or politics. It also has to be about our role in the world. We are faced with a choice between working with other nations across Europe to tackle the big challenges of our age or cutting ourselves off from that world. It must be about hearts and minds. This is a social, cultural and educational union too. Many of our environmental targets come from the EU, our biodiversity targets, air quality, water quality, and we must do more to meet these targets. It is right to be making efforts at strategic EU level to make shared progress. Um, the freedom of movement in Europe, which is one of the Eurosceptics' drivers, works both ways. Thousands of British citizens live and work freely across the EU. We travel with no barriers across the EU. We are part of a European family and we are more connected than ever. Um, the challenges of the modern world don't recognise borders, human trafficking, internet fraud, copyright crime. Um, a few weeks ago we held a debate on the Mediterranean crisis, um, a complex set of challenges that needs EU and international action. And that situation is not isolated. 
that situation encapsulates the demands of our modern world. But as part of the EU, we can influence decision making and help find solutions to those challenges. We need to be part of the debate of moving a far too inward looking, self obsessed Europe into an outward looking, globally orientated Europe. Crucially, so much of our progressive social policy originated in the EU, driving common standards for workers across the EU. We must argue for social solidarity and put this at the heart of the EU again. The EU can be an effective vehicle in advancing social conditions at work. Following campaigns by trade unions across Europe and MEPs, the EU brought in measures to give part-time and temporary workers the same rights as full-time workers as regards training, pensions, maternity rights and leave. It introduced EU-wide laws on working time and required for the first time a guaranteed right to paid holiday. These were significant rights introduced by the EU at a time when it was perhaps easier to demonstrate to people how it benefits them. We are living in much more complex times and the EU must demonstrate that it can respond to the modern economy. Um, I do not think the result of this referendum is predetermined here in Scotland or anywhere else. Um, the initial polling does suggest a yes result, but there is a long way to go. We cannot be complacent about the result. It is important we get a clear result with support from across the UK. Those of us who take a progressive approach towards UK continuing membership should be emphasising the positive way forward. Um, I am concerned that we fall into the trap of focusing too much on process and talking up voting div divisions, um, which the polling suggests don't actually exist, and that this runs the risk of souring the debate and creating false division and grievance. And let's not give the Eurosceptics or UKIP any sucker. We should be tackling this debate head on and building a consensus across the UK for a future in Europe. And instead of talking up the political consequences of a UK exit from the EU, those of us who support staying in the European Union should concentrate all our efforts on making the case for it. Um, if I'm being generous, I do understand the anxiety around a Conservative government taking this referendum forward, and I thought the Cabinet Secretary's comments on what the Conservative agenda is as compared to what other supporters of the EU is were, were fair comment. Um, I have plenty of disagreement with the Conservatives on their politics and on this issue they have disagreements within their own government it appears. But I am not uh, briefly, I have a short time. Uh, on the 9th of June uh, 1975 uh, after the result of the previous referendum Mrs Thatcher said one cannot but let the occasion pass without paying tribute to Winston Churchill and Harold Macmillan who were the original architects of what is now before us. I paraphrase slightly. Your final minute, clear. I can okay. always depend on Stuart Stevenson for an interesting <laughs> intervention. Um, to go back to, uh, can I say that I'm, uh, that I'm not convinced by the introduction of a double majority as the way to resolve some of these issues. Um, I won't deny that different results across the UK would be difficult, um, but let's be clear, the current public reaction does not suggest this will happen. Um, but a double majority is not a logical or a credible solution. Um, we recognise this is a UK vote. We cannot wait votes depending on where you live in the UK. That would be undemocratic. And Gordon Wilson pointed out last week that it would set precedence for any future referendums. And given the ambition of many in the SNP, you would think that would be something they would want to avoid. Um, there are also legal concerns. Uh, the vote is of a member state, not individual parts of that state. Um, this debate would be more productive if we emphasise where we have agreement, which is for the UK to stay in the EU, working in the interests of Scotland and the UK. Let's not engineer a disagreement between Scotland, England and Wales, a situation which gave the Tories the keys to Downing Street and then missed the bigger prize. Mm -hmm. And presiding officers are a member of the EU, we have a voice on the world stage which otherwise would be lost. And whether it's discussions about climate change or our relationship with bigger economies in the world, we have influence far greater than our size would suggest. And in the 21st century, we live in a time which demands cooperation and partnerships, and the European Union is a positive force we should remain part of. I move the amendment in my name. Thanks. I now call on Jamie McGregor to speak to and move Amendment 13404.2 in the name of Alex Johnston. Uh, thank Mr. McGregor, you. six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And with your permission, can I briefly say a word about the tragic death of my fellow Highlander Charles Kennedy, because um, his presence will be missed particularly, I think, in the forthcoming debates in Europe, because I'm sure that Mr. Kennedy would have relished the opportunity of speaking up for the UK's continued membership of the European Union in debates of this kind. Um, now, there is a certain mischievous approach adopted by the Scottish Government's debate this afternoon. Um, we ultimately 
we all know that the Westminster will ultimately decide the EU referendum bill, um, but the SNP is going to take every possible opportunity to use the European referendum debates to further their own agenda. And uh, this, I think, is an early warning of that. I suppose it's quite natural for them to do that. Um, David Cameron made it quite clear in our 2015 manifesto that a future Conservative government would bring forward a bill which would enable a referendum on Britain's future membership of the EU. And we now comfortably have that mandate from the British people. Our commitment to allowing citizens of the UK a say in a night referendum on Europe has never been stronger. Change is required. And I remind the Liberal Democrats that not long ago, they actually pushed the case mm -hmm. with more vigour than we did for a referendum on EU membership. And now we have the acting Labour leader, Harriet Harman, supporting the Conservative government on having a referendum on EU membership by the end of 2017. And let's not forget, of course, it was the SNP who wanted Britain out of the then European community in the 1970s, with many members campaigning against the EU membership right through the 80s and 90s. And this was at the same time that the Conservative government helped to create the single market under Mrs Thatcher, and later the majority government, sorry, the major government, and that's John Major, um, successfully achieved the principle of subsidiarity, opting out of the excesses of the Maastricht Treaty. And the Cabinet Secretary may remember that the EU concessions such as not joining the disastrous single currency or the social chapter were achieved by John Major's Conservative government. Now, I'm a committed supporter of the European Union, but I don't always see it through rose-tinted spectacles. There is much, much wastage and also erosion of national cultures and authority, which is counterproductive and unnecessary. Britain has always been an outward-looking nation. If other countries, such as France, Germany, and Belgium, and maybe in a minute, uh, France, Germany, and Belgium, want a federal model in the shape of the Holy Roman Empire, so, so, uh, um, all right, I'll take an intervention. I thank the member for taking an intervention. And I, I couldn't help thinking, yes, Britain is an outlooking country. Or it, it was. If you look at the bill, the U European Union referendum bill, it doesn't say that I'm allowed to vote. Mind, maybe the competence of the Prime Minister will have to be called in question because in 2-1A, it says a person who, on the date of the referendum, will be entitled to vote as electors at a parliamentary is... election in any constituency. Does that mean I'm allowed to vote? Because we, I'm allowed to vote in parliamentary election in some constituency in Scotland. Would the member will I'll give you some extra time, Mr. Well, I don't know, actually. I have to say, I don't know if you'll be allowed to, uh, to vote or not. And that's my honest answer. Um, but um, I, when we come to, if other countries such as France, Germany, and Belgium want a federal model, a model, in, in the shape of the, sort of the Holy Roman Empire, so be it. But what we want to do is ensure that the EU serves all member nations equally in achieving the objectives which can be agreed upon. We need a lighter and more flexible Europe, Europe, not one that smacks of authoritarianism. And this is what the Prime Minister is fighting for. Practical improvements for all EU member states, not just the UK. Um, and these are good intentions which should surely deserve support. Now, the argument presented by the Scottish Government in their motion talks about the double lock majority, suggesting if one con constituent part of the UK votes against leaving the EU, then this should not force either England, Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland uh, to leave the European Union. But I fail to understand the logic in this in that the other three constituent parts of the UK were given no say at all in the separatism agenda of the SNP in the other referendum. Is this not a palatable sign of this government's inconsistency? And I think Neil Finlay's point in his intervention uh, deserves scrutiny rather than just a brush off. I see all the benefits of the UK remaining a member of the EU, and as a member of the European and External Relations Committee, I've consistently argued that reform of the European Union is required. 
And as the Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, said at the weekend, what we are simply calling for is a fairer deal for Britain. And I'm sure that definitely includes Scotland. And for my own part, the Highlands and Islands desperately needing EU investment as other nations enjoy. David Cameron has yet to set out the specific details of what changes we want to see, but clearly these would include opting out of an ever closer EU, some form of adjusting the benefits for EU migrants and giving greater powers to national parliaments to block EU legislation which could have a negative effect on Britain. This should not be a divisive debate. Questioning our relationship with Europe is not unnatural, as all relationships need questioning from time to time, but to do it in this manner is simply unhelpful. Our Prime Minister will set out a programme of negotiations with our European partners to create not just a better deal for Scotland and other parts of the UK, but also for the EU in general. We intend to make Europe work better, so why doesn't the Scottish Government get behind us, provide support and help us deliver a better deal for Scotland? I move the amendment in the name of Alex Johnston. Many thanks. I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move amendment 13404.1. Mr Rennie, six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. Our country makes, I think, the biggest impression on the globe when we are open, positive, diplomatic and generous. Of course, there have been periods in our history that we prefer to consign to that past and forget about. But we should be proud of what Britain does and what Britain does best when we seek partnership rather than difference. Now, as a Liberal, I'm an internationalist with a hunger to share with others the opportunities and the challenges that this world presents to us. That's why I am pro-European. And we should not forget that out of the ruins of war came one of the most powerful global institutions to spread peace, the European Union. It may seem a rather grandiose claim to talk about peace and the European Union, but yet we should remember that you don't secure peace just by securing and procuring more missiles, more tanks or more fighter jets, but actually secure the more fundamental aspects of life. With the well-being and sharing of the environment, economy and resources comes the well-being, I think, of everyone. Free markets, common social and employment standards, protection of our environment and shared diplomatic endeavours and functions are functions that I value of the European Union and I think help to deeply underpin the security and progress of all our well-being. Yeah, certainly. Neil Finlay. Could, could I maybe ask him to reflect on his comments there and how those values have affected the people of Greece at the moment? I actually think we find that when we're trying to create that single market, when you're trying to force economies together with one single currency that has flaws, we do need to work together. And by keeping Greece in the European Union, I think it's going to benefit all of us. We need to get through this difficult period. But by simply claiming that Greece should exit the European Union, I don't think resolves any of those problems. And I think Neil Finlay would hopefully agree with that as well. Um, of course, sharing such functions, it is not possible to demand it all be conducted in a fashion that we would deliver if we had full and sole control. But the sacrifices and compromises we make through pooled sovereignty brings greater advances. And look, we've all got our own numbers. One in ten jobs in the UK is linked to the EU single market, and nearly half of British trade worth around £500 billion is with EU member states. We talk about 300,000 Scottish jobs linked to EU exports. £1.9 billion to £3.8 billion better off is Scotland as a result of being part of Europe. But we can all get swamped in these kind of numbers and competing statistics. I prefer simply to rely on the concept of internationalism, cooperation and solidarity. I think it's a state of mind and something that we should adhere to in this chamber. And I thank Jamie McGregor for his remarks about Charles Kennedy. I think the campaign that I would argue we should be conducting about the European Union is something that I know Charles Kennedy would also adopt as well. And I'm sure that he would have been a leading member of that EU referendum campaign. I think he would be a proud member of that, and I would be proud that he would be taking part in that Yes campaign. Charles also had the ability to see the big picture. 
And this is where my plea comes into the SNP. I've just got a slight request um, for the SNP to try and see that bigger picture and that bigger cause that I think we're all striving towards. Um, on Sunday morning, um, when the sun was shining through the curtains of my bedroom, I got up at five o'clock. I had a choice. I could either go back to sleep or I could go out for a morning run. So I decided to put my fell shoes on. I drove up to Glendevon, and with the early morning sun shining on my back, I had a splendid few hours run up the Oco Hills looking down over the Forth Valley. I find no greater pleasure in doing such a thing on a Sunday morning. But I have to tell you, when I regale the tales of my times on the hills to my friends and family, I can see their eyes glazing over after a certain amount of time. I have to accept that the world does not revolve around my appreciation of the hills. And there are parallels for the SNP as well. Appreciation of Europe, perhaps? <laughs> 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 Thank you, Deputy President Officer, for that, that wit. Um, there is parallels for the SNP because I think the issue of independence was resolved last year. The world does not revolve around the SNP's ambition for independence. And I would suggest that the double lock proposal from the SNP is simply another means to advance that ambition. That debate was last year. We need to move on. We all need to put our shoulder to the wheel to win this campaign. Pro-Europeans will never forgive the SNP if they demote too much effort to highlighting the divisions within the United Kingdom and insufficient effort to the greater goal of membership of the European Union. So instead of fretting about a double lock or double majority in the EU referendum, the SNP members should embrace the positive campaign to keep the whole of the UK inside the European Union. At the heart of the SNP double lock proposal, there is defeatism and pessimism that I reject. There is an acceptance from them that the UK will choose to leave the European Union and that therefore there must be some kind of protection from, for Scotland from that fate. It is that pessimism that is potentially damaging to the wider movement and one that they should desist from making. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Five minute speeches. Call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, the debate about the UK's membership of Europe is in the main, and I quote, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing, unquote. There is a lot of noise and not a lot of factual analysis. Macbeth, obviously, being a Scot, wasn't referring to Europe, of course, but he might well have been. And the salient lesson for us in this debate is that this debate is about so much more than ambiguous facts or unfacts about welfare and migration. And it is our job, our job, to make sure that the real debate takes place against this nasty right-wing rhetoric. Presiding officer, our right as one of the family of nations, so often referred to by David Cameron, means, according to him, that Scotland is an equal partner. Well, it doesn't seem much like it. Alongside Wales and Northern Ireland, Scotland's voters have and must have the right to stop the UK's withdrawal if the electorate here rejects it. That's not pessimistic, that's equal partnership. Our membership of the EU brings enormous benefits and around 300,000 jobs as well as important investment, as well as that fundamental freedom to travel, to study, to live and work anywhere in Europe. We want to work from within the EU. We don't want to be forced out by a right-wing UK, UKIP-friendly Westminster government. We know that Europe is where we need to be, not just for trade, but for free movement of people, for our own human protections, and for the great cultural melting pot that this block of 28 nations, each with its own unique background history, brings us. Around 171,000 people from elsewhere in the European Union live and work in Scotland. Although they are, by definition, EU citizens, they are to be denied a vote in this referendum. 
even though they are paying their UK taxes, contributing to the economy and utilising their right to live here. They are to be excluded from voting, as of course they also were in the Westminster elections. Now, some may argue it's up to Westminster to decide the franchise, but that's only if the franchise does not discriminate and does not fly in the face of everything I see as democracy, because that's exactly what it does. I find it incomprehensible that citizens of the Commonwealth countries in Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Cyprus and Malta, who all live in the UK, should be allowed to vote, whilst their EU neighbours are denied that democracy. The whole picture for me is illogical, it's insulting and looks rather like gerrymandering the result. Those who live and work here, whether in the EU they happen to, whether, wherever in the EU they happen to come from, might be considered to be a little more likely to vote to stay than some Tory Eurosceptics. Creating an electorate that tallies with your desired outcome is not part of modern day democracy. Which brings me to another crucial point about our electorate. Our young people, between the ages of 16, have known no existence other than being in the EU. And some of the comments I have heard today from Westminster, at the best ill-informed and at the worst just downright offensive. Can I at this juncture, presiding officer, commend all members in this place and Westminster to commend them and the Scottish Youth Parliament, who are here in this building this week with their stall. You should go and speak to them and youth parliaments across these islands for their campaign at Votes at 16. Dr Winnie Ewing in 1967 in her maiden speech spoke up for Votes at 16. This is not a new argument, but some of the arguments being used in Westminster today are old arguments. The youngest of these young people born in 1999, 25 years after the UK signed the Treaty of Rome, they are not familiar with living in the British Empire or Commonwealth. They have generally an assumption of their rights of protection as legislated by the EU, so they take them for granted, and rightly so. Why would anyone feel that they need to question their right to an education, a safe place to live, not to be abused or trafficked, not to be raped or beaten up, to have access to a fair working week and a reasonable standard of living? Scotland's young people voted in our recent referendum. Some voted against independence and many voted in favour. They voted because we and this Scottish Parliament believed in their fundamental right to do so. These are the people who will be responsible close, for please. our future and indeed for paying our pensions through their taxes to deny them the opportunity of contributing a view of Scotland's place in Europe to remove a fundamental human right will impact on all of their futures. Can I remind all of us that these young people, these groups of young people, are the future MPs and MSPs that we will have to answer to. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Stuart Max. Uh, very tight officer, I tend to uh, agree with the Guardian editorial this morning when it suggested that the referendum was another chapter in the destructive Conservative psychodrama over Europe. However, other parties cannot afford to be too high and mighty on this issue. The Labour, Labour Party famously held a referendum 40 years ago because of div divisions uh, in the Labour Party, and I was pleased to vote yes in that referendum, as I shall again this time. And uh, even more bizarrely, and most people forget this, uh, the SNP supported a referendum in 2007. Uh, bizarrely, I'd say, because of, it was because of one line in the Lisbon Treaty about the conservation of marine biological resources, which had always, in fact, been part of the original European Treaty. But let's forget about these issues from the past. Today is a day when I'm substantially in agreement with the SNP, apart from the issue of a double majority, uh, not least because it's just simply not going to happen. Instead, I'd recommend a paper to the SNP from Sinead Douglas-Scott of Oxford University, who has argued that if there is a no vote, it will be necessary to amend relevant parts of devolution legislation via a legislative consent motion. And we all know that's going to be enshrined in, uh, in the new Scotland Act as something that is mandatory. Uh, and, and the part of the Scotland Act, of course, which is relevant is uh, Clause 292D, which says that laws uh, in this Parliament must not be incompatible with any of convention rights or community law. So I think it might be more worthwhile for the SNP to pursue that route rather than uh, a double majority. Now, I agree with the SNP in my own party about voting for 16 and 17-year-olds, and that was well rehearsed in a debate uh, 
a couple of weeks ago. I agree with much of what the First Minister said in her speech about Europe last week, including, for example, in more freedom in relation to public health measures. I agree with what Kezia Dugdale said a few days ago, uh, that EU citizens should have the right to vote in this uh, referendum. And we need to say over and over again how much we value the contribution of EU citizens to this country uh, during the course of this century and before, but of course it's this century that they've come in larger numbers. 170,000 people, some of the best people I know are from the European Union. I won't name them personally to spare them embarrassment. Uh, and we should remember what um, Fiona Hislop said about the paper from University College London. I'd like to read extracts, but because of the shortened speeches, I can't. But the title is Positive Economic Impact of UK Immigration from the European Union. New Evidence, 5th November 2014. Everybody should read that when we hear the mess. The only thing I would say is, of course, if there is undercutting uh, of the minimum wage or other uh, employment conditions, that has if, if European uh, citizens are used to do that, then obviously we must make sure that the law is enforced. There must be no undercutting. But that, of course, is the fault of employers, not of European citizens themselves. Now, as, Fiona, as the Cabinet Secretary said, we need to focus in, this, uh, in the next few weeks and the next few months on the big picture and the current benefits of being a member of the European Union and not become obsessed with the changes which possibly are not going to be all that major, which will cause problems in the Conservative Party. So the economic arguments are clear. Uh, the large, uh, half of UK exports uh, to, are to the European Union, the largest single market in the world, and if we leave, there will be implications for jobs and foreign direct investment. We don't always agree with the direction of economic policy in Europe. Labour in the recent election said, we will work to focus, um, work to focus uh, the EU on jobs and growth, and I'm sure we all agree with that. Labour also, of course, uh, contrary to what uh, uh, the line taken by um, uh, Jamie McGregor, we were proud to sign the social chapter in 1997, and uh, we could list many things that have sprung from that. The 48-hour maximum week, uh, minimum annual leave, extended maternity leave, new rights to request flexible working, holiday pay, same rights for part-time and full-time workers, etc. Environmental progress has, uh, uh, has resulted from Europe, massive reductions in uh, SO2 emissions, basic rules on cleanliness of beaches, and now concerted action on climate change. We could go on. Consumer rights, the EU laws provide for the refund or other remedies for consumers in cases involving defective products. Structural funds mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, 985 million euros uh, and university funding uh, from, by, from, uh, won by Scottish universities, 572 euros, other million euros, other figures could be given. And the fact, talking about research, we have that whole issue of research collaboration, which featured in a recent debate I talked about re 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 research collaboration on renewable those, energy. Please. It could have been many subjects. The EU arrest war making it easier to return fugitives uh, for, um, for a trial, and of course uh, our commitment to the Uni uh, European Court of Human Rights. So many, many positive arguments for Europe, but at the end of the day, let's also put some emotion into this. This is an emotional case for Europe. Remember the origins of the European community after the war to stop any future wars in Europe, and many Conservatives, of course, were fully signed up for that at the time. So let's put forward a positive and emotional uh, case uh, for Europe. Europe uh, and enjoy doing so over the next few months. Many thanks. Now, Colin Stewart Maxwell to be followed by David Stewart. Up to five minutes, please. Officer, um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in today's uh, important debate on the forthcoming EU, EU referendum. It's now, of course, 40 years since the UK voted in favour of continuing its membership of the European Community when over 17 million voters across the UK said yes to Europe. Like many in the Chamber, I was too young back then to participate in what was the first ever referendum to be held across all four nations of the UK. But I am grateful, though, that the voters made a positive choice to remain part of the common market. I believe that Scotland and the UK has benefited greatly from its membership of the EU over the intervening 40 years. More recently, I am proud to have been part of the Yes campaign, arguing in favour of Scotland's independence. Now, although I am disappointed, of course, by the outcome, I felt privileged to have been part of a campaign that energised Scottish voters like never before. With the eyes of the world on Scotland, we held a democratic debate that resulted in an unprecedented level of voter engagement. I hope we can build on this in the coming months as the EU referendum campaign gathers momentum. And I agree with Malcolm Chisholm that this is an emotional debate. It should inspire passion in all of us. And I certainly look forward to that debate. 
The UK Government has now published its bill on the European Union referendum, and I am extremely disappointed, I am sure like many others, to note that the proposed franchise does not include a vote for 16- and 17-year-olds. As a member of the Devolution Further Powers Committee, much of our work has focused on the success of 16- and 17-year-olds being able to vote in the independence referendum. Whether campaigning for yes or for no, young people in colleges, in schools, at work, led the way in debating the big issues on independence in an intelligent and civilised manner. It was inspiring to see the energy and the passion with which many of Scotland's young people articulated their views throughout the campaign. We are using the powers of this Parliament to bring forward proposals to lower the voting age for all future elections to the Scottish Parliament and local authority elections. Uh, sorry, I don't have time in the five minutes, which I know has cross-party support. The case for entrusting 16- and 17-year-olds with a vote in the EU referendum is overwhelming. To deny our young people a say is undemocratic, and I would urge opposition MP MSPs to lobby their colleagues at Westminster to support the SNP amendments to ensure that 16- and 17-year-olds are able to take part in the EU referendum vote. Presenting officer, I watched with interest last week when the First Minister spoke so passionately in support of the European Union at the European Policy Centre in Brussels. The First Minister rightly highlighted the EU's considerable achievements over the past 60 years, in particular the role it's had to play in promoting peace, reconciliation and democracy across Europe. Economic arguments are often the focus of the EU question. But the award in 2012 of the Nobel Peace Prize to the EU perhaps demonstrates its most important achievement. On presenting the award, the Norwegian Nobel Committee highlighted the stabilising role the EU has played in transforming most of Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace. Helping to facilitate peace and reconciliation in post-war Europe is something of true worth. Now, as others have said, it is estimated that over 170,000 people born elsewhere in the EU now call Scotland home. Like others, I have grown concerned about the apparent demonisation of EU migrants from certain sections of the media. Indeed, evidence shows that EU migrants bring significant economic and social benefits to our communities, with a study by the University College London finding that skilled EU migrants have provided an extra £20 billion to the UK economy over the past decade by paying more in taxes than they take in benefits. Now, some people forget that we are all able to benefit from the right to free movement within the EU, which has enabled thousands of Scots to travel and make new lives for themselves in countries all across Europe. You would think, listening to Eurosceptics, that it is all one-way traffic, but you only have to travel in France, Spain or Italy, not to mention other European countries, to find many people from the UK who have settled there quite happily. There are considerable advantages to membership of the EU, but that is not to say that the European Union is not without its flaws. Reform is needed, though I believe that significant improvements can be made within the existing treaty framework. It is only by being a constructive member of the EU that we can successfully influence its legislation and its policies. Now, my experience as one of the Parliament's representatives on the EU Committee of the Regions has led me to conclude that more needs to be done to give the Scottish Parliament and regional parliaments in Europe a greater voice in the EU decision-making process. Scotland is active at the EU level, of course, but it cannot exercise full influence in the Council. Presiding officer, to conclude, to the EU certainly has its challenges to face. Reform is needed, but I believe strongly that Scotland's interests are best served by working constructively with our partners and allies within the EU, rather than being on the periphery. Others have spoken of the importance of the double majority safeguard to ensure that Scotland or any other nation of the UK cannot be forced out of the EU against its will. As a multinational state, such a scenario is not unforeseeable and would undoubtedly have major constitutional implications. If those advocating withdrawal from the EU are so confident in their arguments, then they should have nothing to fear from putting in place this democratic safeguard. Indeed, they should embrace it wholeheartedly. Thanks very much. I now call on David Stewart to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, just over four decades ago, I had my first ever vote in a referendum when I voted yes to staying in the European Economic Community. Britain's relationship with Europe has provided some rough sailing for political parties and leaders, even for renowned yachtsman Ted Heath, who navigated the UK into the common market in 1973. French President de Gaulle had rebuffed Britain on several previous occasions and had formed a powerful alliance with Germany. And Stuart Stevenson is quite right to point out the contribution that Churchill made post-war as leader of the opposition to make sure there was a wider voice for Europeans and Britain within Europe. 
The referendum in 1975 was a clear victory for a continued membership, with 67% of the vote saying yes. But presiding officer, this was not a cosy campaign to run for the Prime Minister at the time, Harold Wilson, who had agreed that his Cabinet members were free from ministerial collective responsibility and left-wing firebrand, firebrand Tony Benn was a leading light in the no campaign. Perhaps the Wilson Diaries should be required reading for the current Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron. Of course, John Major's election victory surprised many commentators, but the period of his time as leader was characterised by well-organised guerrilla tactics for the significant group of Eurosceptics who opposed the Maastricht Agreement. And this, along with Black Wednesday, uh, was undoubtedly a factor in Labour's landslide victory in 1997. But this afternoon, President Officer, I do welcome this debate and I support the thrust of the Cabinet Secretary's motion and I welcome and endorse 16 and 17 year olds and of course all EU citizens having a vote. I want to touch very briefly in the restricted time I have about a case study of how the EU works in practice to benefit Scotland generally and my region, Highlands and Islands specifically, that is the economic and social benefits of EU structural funds. I could have focused on other benefits of membership energy security, international trade or social protection for workers. Additionally, I could have focused on the benefits for business as the EU provides the market for almost half of our international exports, which supports more than 300,000 jobs in Scotland. Now, structural funds have been vital for the Highlands and Islands in my region. The current programme, we've got around €192 million Euros out of the €985 million for the whole of Scotland. Now, this is not a paternalistic sop from Eurocrats but a crucial economic lever to make sure that our region and my region is up to the EU average. It provides planning and economic opportunities to exploit emerging sectors such as life sciences, renewable energy and the creative industries. This transition region status helps my region, as Jimmy McGregor pointed out, overcome natural handicaps and allows Highlands Islands to work with the rest of Scotland in contributing to the EU 2020 goals of promoting smart, sustainable and inclusive growth within the UK economy. But, President Officer, just for the record, I am not claiming, as other members have also mentioned, that the EU is perfect. We, of course, need to look at reform, but I believe it's possible to do it within the tre treaty framework rather than treaty change. And very briefly, there's two areas which I think we need to look at. I believe the EU should focus on economic and social policies which make a real difference to ordinary, hard-working families. And secondly, Regulatory reform is crucial, for example, in the common fisheries policy. We need more decisions at regional level. The key principles need to be proportionality and subsidiarity. And I'd like to focus on the issue of EU migrants and access to the welfare system. As Daniel Keneally of Edinburgh University said in evidence to the European and External Relations Committee this month, this is a crucial issue for the UK government. And, he, and the quote from him was, everything else is garnish. He makes a sound argument with the following points. Most migrants in the UK come from outside the EU, and it's a two-way street. And, of course, many UK citizens live and work across the EU. And EU migrants contribute more to the UK economy in taxes than they take out. Perhaps in the winding up, the Cabinet Secretary could look at the Labour and Lib Dem initiative about fresh talent working in the Scotland scheme. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any plans to reintroduce this, or could perhaps give us the status that it's currently at? I'm very conscious of time, uh, presiding officer, but I believe that the referendum on the future of EU membership in 2017, or whenever it's going to be, is yet another crucial milestone on the rocky road that has characterised this debate over the last 10 years and beyond. No one is arguing the EU is perfect or beyond reform, but I believe it's a force for good, for jobs, services and workers' rights, and let us avoid all costs a retreat to the margins and wastelands that is withdrawal. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Christian Allard. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Forty years ago, Scotland and indeed the UK had just experienced the first EU referendum at a time when the governing party was divided over the issue and after the nature of the negotiations being carried out by the government to the day were not entirely clear, so no change there. But of course, much has changed. A Europe of nine member states has become one of 28. Scotland more Eurosceptic about Europe then than the rest of the UK, it's now the reverse. Of course, my own party has now fully embraced the European Union, recognising its importance to Scotland. And finally, of course, in contrast to the 1975 government, uh, government ministers uh, were, uh, are uh, not to be free to campaign on either side, or at least that seemed to be the position until last night. 
Um, whatever the merits of another referendum, we are now likely to have one. And it seems appropriate, therefore, to try and make this referendum something that the public can engage in as fully as the Scottish referendum. That surely ought to mean not only votes for 16- and 17-year-olds, but for those EU citizens, not just from Cyprus, Malta and Ireland, but also for those from, those from other European states whose citizens live amongst us. One of the ironies of this debate is that at the same time as the Westminster Government is saying no to votes for colleagues such as Christian Allard, it's proposing legislation known as the Votes for Life Bill to extend the franchise to UK citizens who have not lived in the UK for 15 years or more. And whatever their historic ties to the UK, it cannot be said to be like that they are likely to be directly affected in the same way that Mr Allard will be affected if a decision were taken by the UK to pull out of the EU. And yes, I know this legislation will not impact on the referendum if passed, but it does, I believe, suggest a direction of travel for this government. The Scottish government, of course, has proposed the double lock so that Scotland can, cannot be pulled out of Europe against her will. The United Kingdom, of course, has no written constitution, but states that do have a written constitution, Canada, for example, in Canada, all federal states must agree to a proposal in relation to the monarchy. So such protection for constituent parts is not unknown. And I'm heartened that the SNP amendment at Westminster today has support from both Wales and Northern Ireland. Presiding officer, for Scotland, the EU is important. In 2013, it was the destination for 46% of Scotland's total exports, and on 300,000 jobs depend on it. Yes, there are frustrations with the EU. Yes, it needs reform. Subsidiarity and proportionality need to be given much greater respect. The importance given to subsidiarity in the Lisbon Treaty needs to be adhered to. Yes, red tape should be reduced. Yes, we need clarification on how the relationship between countries within the Eurozone and those outside should work to ensure that the interests of those outside are fully protected. But wanting to reform from within is surely a more credible position than to be perceived as negotiating from within with one hand on the exit door. Last week, we heard evidence on the European and External Affairs Committee that negotiations may not be straightforward. Professor Keating of the University of Aberdeen and Economic and Social Research Council Centre on Constitutional Change said in relation to welfare benefits, quote, if Britain starts trying to restrict things, there will certainly be reciprocal action against British citizens elsewhere. Dr Daniel Keneally of the University of Edinburgh Academy of Government said, if there is a dialogue between the UK and Europe about reforming the European Union for the benefit of everybody, the public may have more of an appetite for a longer debate, as opposed to what would happen if the debate is presented as a battle with Europe. A battle with Europe might suit some on the Tory right, but I would question whether that will ultimately benefit the United Kingdom. And of course, we do need to ensure this debate extends beyond the issue of whether removing in-work benefits will require treaty change to a wider debate of what Europe is for and what kind of Europe we want. Do we want to see a UK that turns its back on fellow Europeans to refuse to provide financial assistance to Greece, Spain and Portugal, as John Redwood and the Tory right believe? Do we want a UK that turns its back on the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean, or one that recognises this, this is just, not just a problem for Italy or Malta or Greece, but for Europe as a whole? Do we want a UK that wants to roll back its employment and social protection, that seeks to protect the city and its financial services industry, but is reluctant to curb its bankers' bonuses. Presiding officer, this is a government which talks tough on Europe, but whose actions indicate it does not understand Europe fully. A balance of competence review was uh, started in 2012 by the Tory and Liberal coalition. A review of what the EU does and how it affects us in the UK, it was stated, seeking to inform debate, but not to draw conclusions. It was concluded in December 2014, and in March this year, the House of Lords EU Committee said it had made no impact on the public debate on the UK-EU relationship. As Professor Keating said in evidence last week, the, the review has not found any competencies close, that could be appropriately repatriated to the UK. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, last week in Brussels, the First Minister said that Scotland had much to offer Europe, but much to learn. I hope that the UK Government will heed those words. The alternative, Fortress Britannia, is not a prospect that I, for one, would welcome. Many thanks. Now I call on Christian Allard to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Thank you very much, President Officer. And you wouldn't be surprised that I would be, of course, going on the side of the Scottish Government tonight, and particularly that I, I do feel uh, being isolated uh, with that uh, legislation coming forward. But I'm not alone. Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, 
EU citizen living in Scotland and living in the UK. So I do feel that we have not seen the end of it yet. I think the franchise, which was designed by the Conservative Party, will be challenged. And it will be challenged not only at Westminster, not only in this Parliament, but it will be challenged outside. And so it should be. Because at the end of the day, we need to send a strong message from this chamber today, a message of solidarity to amend the UK government's referendum bill. A lot of my colleagues use quotation. I might use one of them. Uh, we, a lot of my constituents, a lot of people in the northeast uh, are quite surprised when they know that I won't have a vote uh, as it stands in the uh, referendum uh, to take us out of the EU. But one particularly made a certain comment, uh, one from Abdul Shah East. He said today, I believe, he said this morning, I go to Christian Allard wherever I have difficulties in my constituency and is not is to be denied a vote. Of course, it's uh, our former First Minister, Alex Salmon. And it's not the first time that he's been talking about it in the House of Commons. And he's not the only one doing it. It's very, very important to understand that it's not only about EU nationals resident in the UK, but it's also about 16 and 17 years old. We should all be included in the franchise. Imagine, imagine when the uh, referendum will take place. Imagine on polling day, people like myself, young people, 16 and 17 years old, we will go to the polling station if we don't hurt about the franchise, they will stand in front of uh, the table where we will see a list. And on that list, their name will be there. Because, of course, they are allowed to vote in other elections. But they will be denied a vote. That shouldn't be so. That shouldn't be right. I voted, my first vote in a referendum was in 1997 for this parliament. Then thereafter, I voted in every Scottish uh, election. I voted particularly in every European election. And I voted, of course, last year. So it's not a question of being denied a vote that we never had before. It's a question of being denied a vote that we have enjoyed. As much as I've spent all my entire life here, and I've been living and I've been working, but more importantly, I've been voting in Scotland. And this is important to realize. Same thing for 16 and 17 years old. They voted for the first time last year. Well, now, in this parliament, what we decided, they will vote in every Scottish parliamentary election. It's very, very important, presenting officer, that we keep them engaged and we keep them locked in and making sure that they get engaged in the democratic process. There is no point asking somebody to go to a polling station one day and another day not, not to go. They, they all went, we all went voting last year. We couldn't vote in general election. We're going to, going to vote in 2016 the Scottish election. Then if the referendum happens in 2017, we won't be allowed to vote. This doesn't make sense at all in a 21st century modern Scotland. And it's a question of respect. And of course, I absolutely agree with the Scottish government about the double majority clause. We need this to assure that no nation of the UK will be pulled out of the European Union against its democratic will. We heard about family of nations. Christina McElvey reminded, that, reminded us of this. And it's about EU citizenship as well. And it's about respect, not only to this nation, Scotland, but the respect to our EU partners as well. You know, we don't know what we're going to vote on. We don't know if I'm going to be able to vote, but we don't know what we're going to be vote on. You know, negotiation has not happened. We don't know what is going to be the agenda. I feel, that, I feel for the people who are going to be allowed to vote, who, who are going to think about it the years coming, because we have no idea what we're going to vote on. And it's about democracy. It's about inclusion, and it's about respect. So I, I'm kind of a voice, and I can understand that. A lot of EU nationals, the 90,000 in, in Scotland, and even the 1.5 million across the UK, I've seen myself as a voice for them, for the disenfranchised. 
And a lot of petition online, I will encourage members to, 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 to go and join them. But the last thing I would say, it's about what I said earlier on about the bill. It's not sure yet on 21A if we are allowed to vote or not. I think there is a misunderstanding there. There's no misunderstanding on 21B. It appears that I'm not allowed to vote, but the members of the House of Lords are allowed to vote. I will leave you on this archaic and much. absolutely undemocratic way of seeing how we should conduct ourselves in the 21st century. Thank you. Presenting officer. Now I call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you. On the 1st of November 2013, I was pleased to have the opportunity to lodge a motion before Parliament noting the 20th anniversary of the formal establishment of the European Union and its current guise. In the nearly 22 years that I have followed the establishment, the EU has not got everything right. But I believe few in this chamber would argue that we are anything but better off for it. I know that I can go anywhere within the central Scotland region, and it won't take me long to find projects in communities that EU funding has helped. That is why I would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Government for bringing forward this debate to allow us to discuss the merits of our continued membership of the European Union. Free movement of trade has enhanced our society and enriched our culture as well as our exports. Free movement of labour is often chastised by politicians and political commentators alike. But as a McMahon, it would be sheer hypocrisy to come before you today with anything but praise for it and the contribution European migrants have made to Scotland. It was a great Scot and European Robin Cook MP who, as the first Labour Foreign Secretary for 18 years, op opted into the European Union's social chapter. It was one of the first decisions taken by the last Labour government. It was also one of the most important. Older, or shall I say more experienced colleagues, may recall that the social chapter was described by none other than the then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in 1990 as a throwback to a Marxist period, a class struggle period. Those of us who value the contributions of trade unions ought to be concerned about the plans her ideological successors have for the chapter and workers' rights. Their Dickensian proposals for strike ballots suggest that they won't miss an opportunity to target the labour movement. It is very important that they remain vigilant to the danger of Cameron and Co negotiating away any hard-won rights they can. We cannot allow the rollback of health and safety at work laws to be painted as a victory for Britain. If they try to take Britain out of the EU-wide laws on working time, it is our responsibility to inform the public that it is the European laws which limit the amount of time they can be obligated to work by their employer to 48 hours a week, and which guarantee the right to a paid holiday. Employees whose companies change hands automatically retain the same conditions they had with their previous employers, whereas those in large companies are granted a voice in the workplace through the European Works Council. The gains of the trade union movement throughout Europe enacted in law in the much of the EU's social agenda allows our workers to be more secure in their jobs. The values they espouse and the rights they create are incompatible to the agenda of the Conservative government. A government which, even when constrained by the Liberal Democrats, enacted charges against employees who were trying to take their employers to work tribunals and encourage workers to sell their labour rights for shares. I welcome the pro-European tone of the Cabinet Secretary and many of those who have spoken today. But I must suggest that they ought to tread carefully with some of their statements not to inflame anti-EU rhetoric. When I say this, I am thinking particularly of their justification for voting against Labour amendments to force private companies working on public sector contracts to pay their staff the living wage. It was only a few weeks ago the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon told BBC Radio Scotland's Good Morning Scotland that it was European law that meant that her party could not support Scottish Labour proposals in the Procurement Reform Act last year. At the time, noted solicitors Thompson submitted a report to Parliament stating how enshrining the living wage and procurement reform was possible. Trade unionists Dave Moxham and Dave Watson, who I am sure are respected across the chamber, have written about how our Parliament could enact such legislation if the will was there. If that was not enough, the First Minister's claim was already dismissed by the EU themselves when the previous First Minister made it. The EU referendum is an opportunity to have a debate about our rights, about jobs and Scotland's place in the world. It is not an opportunity for political parties to try and justify their past mistakes. The EU did not force the government to vote down the living wage. In the run-up to the referendum, there will be enough people willing to throw stones at the EU and do down the very real contributions the EU makes to our daily lives. It is so important that those of us who consider ourselves pro-European rally around organisations and do not pass the blame onto, e onto the EU to make our own political lives that bit easier. Final minute. It is important that we recognise that Europe does not curtail the legislative ambitions of individual member states, but rather sets a minimum standard for others to follow. 
This is particularly true when considering the impact of European legislation on the rights of female workers. The EU ensures that its members must give both parents the right to time off when a child is born or indeed adopted. EU laws reverse the burden of proof in discrimination cases and give part-time and temporary workers the same legal rights as full-time workers with respect to leave, maternity rights, pensions and training. I am very pleased by the broad consensus in favour of our continued membership of the European Union and look forward to campaigning with colleagues to not only retain our membership of the organisation, but the benefit workers in Scotland get from it. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Willie Coffey to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thanks very much, President Officer. Scotland has a long, historic and independent connection with Europe that predates the Union with England, and it's still going strong. Indeed, the alliance with France up to 1560 lasted nearly 200 years. Um, our universities have always had close ties with Europe, and our people have settled there long before there was a European Union. Currently, over 300,000 Scottish jobs depend on our membership of the single market, the biggest in the world, with its 500 million citizens. Our task as Scottish parliamentarians is to protect and nurture that legacy and not to allow our country's aspirations to be limited by or to be dictated to by the negative anti-European agenda that has brought this referendum to the table. That is why it is crucial that the UK negotiating position must be representative of the whole of the UK and not just the fears of the Tory party in England. We are told we are a family of nations, so the UK must respect that and seek to deliver positive changes that address particular circumstances important to Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, as well as for England. Our contributor to the European Committee, Dr Eve Hepburn from Edinburgh University, warned us that it appears that the interests of the devolved administrations have been overlooked in the case of the UK's current efforts to renegotiate the UK's terms of agreement, despite the impact this will undoubtedly have on their interests and competencies. President officer, we can't allow that to happen, and the Joint Ministerial Committee in Europe surely can't continue to meet simply to listen to the devolved administration's issues and then ignore them. It has to form a genuine UK position that reflects all of our interests. Perhaps a way of bringing this about might be in the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland administrations meeting to find some common ground in which to negotiate. And I'm sure our Scottish Government will be keen to take that forward. On the question of the double majority, why is it that Scotland and Wales' position on this is supported by the Welsh Labour First Minister, but Scottish Labour can't even bring themselves to support their own country's interests? If England votes to leave the EU, and, no, hold on, I've got five minutes, thank you. If England votes to leave the EU and Scotland votes to stay in, Scottish Labour is happy to see Scotland dragged out of Europe and the consequent disastrous impact this would have on Scottish jobs. In any case, the double majority idea provides the UK with the opportunity to really demonstrate that it meant what it said by its family of nations sermon. And when you think of it, it actually provides the Prime Minister with a valuable insurance policy if he can't persuade the voters in England to stay in. This can't be a vote to be determined by the larger nation's voter numbers. All of the nations must have an equal voice, otherwise there is no union. Our regular and welcome contributor to the European Committee, Dr Dan Keneally, described the issue of EU migrants to the UK as being the set piece of the negotiating drama. And I think it was mentioned by Mr Stewart, who has left the chamber for the moment, and that everything else in the debate was just a little garnish. Voters, particularly in England, need to know that migration is a two-way relationship, that most migrants to the UK come from outside the European Union, and that EU migrants contribute more to the UK economy and taxes than they take out. Dr Keneally went on to remind us that the European Court of Justice has made it clear that anyone moving to another country simply to claim benefits is not entitled to do so. So it would be ridiculous if people, particularly in England, voted to leave the EU because they objected to EU migrants coming to live in England to work or look for work or to study. All of the parties must be clear on this and make sure that people have the facts. The UK government's aims in this area, he said, would require the UK to amend or secure an opt-out from EU directives concerning free movement and social security systems. But all of these also carry risks that Final any minute. changes could fall foul of the Court of Justice. That takes us more towards treaty reform as a means of securing any changes from interference from the Court. 
But we know there's no appetite for this, particularly when Mr Juncker has expressly ruled that out as far as free movement issues are concerned. And there's no time to affect treaty changes anyway, not to mention the referendums that would be required in other member states. So, President Officer, where do we go from here? As our other guest at the European Committee, David Frost, a former diplomat with considerable experience, said we might be heading for a classic Euro fudge. The EU appearing to concede or willing to offer major reforms down the line, and Mr Cameron trumpeting these as sufficient gains to enable them to recommend a yes vote. Meanwhile, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland's interests being sidelined because of a Euro fudge to save the skin of the Tories doesn't sound close. like me to be a recipe to keep the Union ticking over. Scotland's interests must be protected and Scottish MSPs must stand up for Scotland if England votes no. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like others, I uh, have to admit I wasn't a wild enthusiast for the idea of a referendum on European Union membership, but I acknowledge it as a reality. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm uh, described it as uh, perhaps uh, reminiscent of the destructive psychodrama within the Conservative Party. Well, I suppose we can only hope, but let's not be complacent that that will be the consequence. Greens, during the, the campaign and in the run-up to it, will make a, a case for membership of the European Union. Greens throughout these islands will make that case. But it will be a distinctive case. It will be one very different, I think, from the case that Mr Cameron makes if he does manage to come back from the European Union with a package of pro-free market, pro-big business reforms. He will be setting out a very different kind of Europe than the one I wish to live in. There's a great deal to be proud of about the social and environmental protections that have been achieved across the European Union, but those are precisely the kind of regulations that many on the Conservative right wish to ditch. They want a Europe of free markets. I want a Europe of social and environmental protection. So while we will make a case for membership, we have a much deeper case to continue to win on progressive economics within the European Union, on protection of human rights and a humane society, on opposing the idea uh, that uh, free markets should be a, a, a policy priority for the European Union, but people, people should not be free. People should be subjected to humiliating uh, uh, welfare policies designed to remove people's ability to decide where they want to move. The idea that capital is freer than people in a European Union, that is a recipe for even deeper exploitation. And I, th I think if I understood correctly the exchange that Mr Finlay and Mr Rennie had earlier, I think if I understood Mr Finlay's point, he was arguing that countries like Greece are threatened not by the European Union, Union per se, but by its obsession with austerity and free market economics, if he wishes to intervene. Neil Finlay. I'm going to make that point that the, the whole issue about the free movement of capital and labour is not being done in the interests of people. It's been done in the interests of capital. And that's the whole problem that we have. Patrick Hyde. I, I agree with, with Mr Finlay. Uh, is there a case for reform of the European Union? Of course there is. Of course there is a case for reform. But I'd like to see a reform agenda which is led uh, by a, a focus on citizens' democracy within the European Union, on taking some power away from the unelected Commission, in asserting that the European Union is a union of European citizens, not a Euro union of European governments, by putting power in the hands of voters and their directly elected representatives, rather than governments and their appointees. Reform also in the area of corporate lobbying, which is far too powerful an influence at European level, uh, level, and reform in relation to areas such as competition law, which restrict the ability of governments to protect the common good of their citizens all too often. Moving on to some of the issues about the rules by which this referendum will be conducted, I agree with the comments that have been made about EU citizens having the right to vote, and of course about 16 and 17 year olds. After the experience of the independence vote, the only argument against 16 year olds being able to vote is based on a fear of their democratic empowerment. That's the only basis on which I think uh, those in the Conservative Party are opposing that. On the date 
there has been opposition to the suggestion. It may be receding now, but we should kill it off for good, the suggestion that the referendum might clash with the Holyrood election. And though my amendment wasn't selected for debate, and I suspect the Labour amendment may not find its way into the final resolution at the end of the day, I suggest to the Cabinet Secretary that the political parties in this Parliament write jointly to the Prime Minister, making clear the absolute unacceptability uh, of any clash with the Scottish Parliament election. As for the proposal of a double majority, well, I'm, I'm open to hearing the argument for it. But I am a little sceptical. First of all, I'm not convinced that it's realistic. The rules of a referendum have to be agreed by all sides. Uh, and I, I just don't see it likely uh, that the other side of the border or the other side of the debate will agree to the double majority proposal. I'm not convinced that it's necessarily fair. I can see why it might seem so from a Scottish perspective. But if Scotland did vote to stay in and England voted to leave... The question is still whether the UK as a whole stays or leaves, and I'm not sure conclude. there's a consistent answer to that question. And thirdly, it does strike me as a potential distraction from the priority we should all be united on of making the case for the whole of these islands, Scotland and the rest of the UK, to remain a part of the European Union. Uh, and for that reason, I think we should focus on making that argument. Many thanks. Can I ask our two final speakers to stick to the five minutes, please? Stuart Stevenson, to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And perhaps it might be just as well to declare at the outset uh, a personal and family interest in the matter, uh, since my niece, who's a scientist, uh, lives and works in Sweden. Uh, jo enjoys her time there. And Jamie, my nephew, uh, lives and works in Denmark, where he is a teacher. Uh, so I have a great nephew and a great niece who, in Danish, are half Den. In other words, half Danish and half Scots. And if it had not been for the existence of the free travel uh, to go and work without any great difficulty, I suspect uh, the history of my family uh, in the modern time might be a little bit different than it actually is. Now... We've heard a bit about who can vote. And, of course, the answer for uh, Christian Allar is extremely straightforward. Uh, the Liberal Party have eight members of the House of Commons and 101 members of the House of Lords. Pro rata, that means that probably the SNP can appoint 707 members to the House of Lords. And I propose that Christian Allar be the first of them because then he meets the necessary requirements to allow him to vote. However... Let's go a little bit deeper into this act uh, that the Tories have uh, brought before us. And we discover some very interesting things. While he might not be allowed to vote, he is allowed to be a part permitted participant in the referendum, to register a campaign, to contribute all his worldly wealth, to go into hawk if he wishes to, and campaign for a particular result. And by the way, that also includes 16 and 17-year-olds could establish campaigns, be permitted participants. So you're allowed to influence the outcome, but not be part of the outcome. A quite bizarre uh, way uh, of bringing forward a piece of legislation. Uh, and, of course, Christian Allard would consider the matter uh, very carefully and cast his vote in an appropriate way. And that would be true uh, of many of our citizens. And, of course, even more bizarre, you come to the situation of the citizens of Gibraltar, all those who are allowed in the extended uh, constituency in the southwest of England to be, for the European elections, uh, part of uh, that vote, allowed to vote in this. Hmm, fascinating. Oh, by the way, the peers, of course... Peers who are not even UK citizens, peers who are not EC citizens, but who are electors in the city of London, they would be entitled to vote. So that you've got this bill, this tawdry piece of paper uh, from the Tory government there, riddled with inconsistencies to deny citizens of Europe who have the greatest stake in this referendum, who contribute mightily to the economy of the UK and of Scotland, denied the vote, while many of the parasites, simply by a right of owning property in the City of London, are able to participate and to set up campaigns on whichever side of the argument. It's a totally 
banal, a bizarre uh, piece of legislation that's before us. Now, I don't stand before you as someone who is an uncritical uh, supporter of the EU, representing fishermen in Scotland. I, of course, share with them the discomfort that uh, when a fishing boat that is registered in Scotland goes out, it's covered by our regulations, but it can be alongside in the same place off our shores. Uh, for example, a Spanish boat working to a different set of reg legislation. And that's got to be something that we've got to fix. But we can do that. Um, we're making uh, some sort of progress. Now, I'm going to really live dangerously. Last week, I lived dangerously when I quoted Alistair Campbell, uh, who described uh, Charles Kennedy as somebody who spoke human. And I thought he spoke excellent sense on that. Thank but I'm going to go even further, presiding officer, and quote Margaret Thatcher. So that's really living uh, dangerously. Uh, in June 75, in the debate after the result of the last referendum, uh, she uh, said, we join him in rejoicing, a favourite word of Margaret Thatcher, over this excellent result. We're particularly pleased with a strong yes for, from each of the constituent nations of the UK. She recognised the importance of achieving that support from each of the constituent nations. And perhaps the Tories should consider what their dear leader said in 1975 in considering the position that they uh, now wish to take. I hope, presiding officer, that both the amendments uh, from Labour and Liberal uh, do resonate around the chamber, although because they delete important things from the government motion, I suspect we will not support them. For my part, I'd be happy to support their contents, if not their deletions. Presiding officer. Many thanks. And now I call Hans Alan Malik. Thank you very much and good afternoon, presiding officer. The Prime Minister, David Cameron, is attempting to renegotiate the terms of the United Kingdom membership to the European Union ahead of the referendum 2017. As we all know, at the top of Cameron's list of demands for renegotiation in the EU is the issue of freedom of movement and migration rights, migrant rights. The debate has been dominated by the issue of immigration. However, the relationship with the European Union is very complex, alongside the freedom of movement that citizens of member states have within the European Union. There is free trade. European Union membership also provides a wide range of rights, responsibilities, and funding streams that Scottish institutions can access. In recent years, other European member states have elected Eurospectic uh, parties, and there is definitely a climate for reform. But wanting proper democratic accountability and decisions and the difficulties of implementing the so-called yellow card mechanism to block European Commission's proposals is a matter that requires informed discussion. Unfortunately, in recent years, the tone of the public debate has been quite the opposite. Stalked by UKIP and the anti-immigration media, the European Union migrants have become the boogeyman to blame for everything from housing shortage to littering the streets. As I have said before, I believe a lot of anti-immigration rhetoric is basically racism, and it shows its true colors. There are various statistics that show that the European migrants contribute more to our economy, and that's something I don't need to repeat, as has already been mentioned by several MSPs already. The Scottish Government frequently states that Scotland has a different approach to immigration. This is not really backed up by any evidence. The research by the Oxford Migrate, Migrant Observatory revealed that the majority of Scots support re reduction in immigration, as 85% of the population feel that way, although it is lower than England and Wales, which is at 75%. So that speaks volumes in itself. What I think is worth repeating is that 
there is no point in the Scottish Government saying that we want more immigrants to come to Scotland if we are not actually combating the racism in our own society here today. Turning to the proposed proposal about there should be a double majority, I think that Dr. Daniel Kennedy from the academic, uh, 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 Academy of Government made the point very well in his written statement to the European External Relations Committee, which he, he stated, it would be useful if the Scottish Government could be clearer about what, if any, distinct or specific interest Scotland has in the process as opposing and repeatedly calling for a multi-veto block. Interesting comments from Dr. Kennedy. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can address this and perhaps give us some clarity on how she feels about that. Final minute. Every time I have asked searching questions from the Cabinet Secretary, I've generally had silence rather than an answer. I'm hoping that today I will get some answers. We have to be quite clear about our direction, where we want to travel, how do we want to go. At the moment, we are in the process of trying to renegotiate. I think it's important that we back a government at this stage in terms of the renegotiation. If and when there is a need for a referendum, then we address that at that stage. But I think um, in terms of immigration, I would be really interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary's comments about how she tends to address that in, in, in terms of what the findings are. Thank you very much. Many thanks. We now turn to the winding up speeches and I call on Willie Rennie, maximum six minutes, please. I think there's been very fine pro-European speeches from right across the chamber. I think even from the Conservative benches, we've heard some words of praise about the benefits of the European Union. I suspect not something their colleagues south of the border may repeat too often, but nevertheless, I think there is some degree of unity across the chamber. But I'd like to draw attention, I think, particularly to Stuart Maxwell's comments, where he talked about the Nobel Peace Prize and the fact that um, you, the European Union has helped turn uh, a continent of war to a continent of peace. And he talked about peace, reconciliation and democracy. I think at the core of the European Union is that fundamental value and benefit that we have secured. And I thank Stuart Maxwell for making that contribution. Because often those who have lived through the European Union with, without war, I think we often take it for granted um, that it will always be there. And we should not forget that the European Union has contributed significantly towards that. Um, I concluded my um, opening remarks with a plea to the SNP benches to focus on what unites us rather than divides us. But I'm afraid too often uh, from the benches, apart from Stuart Maxwell, um, there were far too many people sought to almost adopt a position where the rest of the United Kingdom um, was going to vote to leave the European Union. Um, I think that pessimism should be rejected and we should work together to make sure that we do stay in the European Union. If you only look at the latest polling, and in fact, if you look at the polling over the last few decades, more often than not, Britain has been a pro-European nation. It's wanted to stay in rather than get out. Of course, um, there are the Nigel Farages of the world, but we should not make the mistake of assuming that everybody in England shares their views with Nigel Farage. Um, far from that. That's why he suffered uh, so badly, I believe, in the recent uh, general election. His support for that kind of um, anti-European scepticism, I think, was roundly rejected. Um, and I think we should give comfort in that. We should actually give more credit to people across the United Kingdom for being pro-European. Even the bookies are reckoning that Britain will stay in the European Union. The bookies, um, not, not just now, the bookies have um, said that they predict that we will all vote to stay in the European Union. So rather than assuming that the rest of England and the rest of the United Kingdom will vote to leave and therefore we'll have to have a get-out clause to make sure that we're able to stay, let's just work together to build on that pro-European consensus that I think is developing across the United Kingdom. And there's been a few references to Charles Kennedy uh, today. Um, and he said this one thing back in 2009, particularly prescient, I think, uh, for the moment. Now more than ever, membership of a strong, confident, effective, outward-looking European Union should be the absolute priority. Playing games with something so important 
is dangerous and short-sighted. I would just leave those words hanging with the SNP. Let's work together to keep us in the European Union. It is of great benefit to us here in Scotland as well as the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, I may come to regret this, um, but I reluctantly agree that Christian Allard should have a vote in the European referendum. I may regret it. Um, I don't want this to be a precedent for all other occasions. There may be occasions where I may want to stop Christian Allard having a vote, particularly in this chamber. But otherwise, on this particular occasion, not just because we agree on this issue, but I agree that he should have a vote in this referendum. It may have consequences um, for those who vote in future general elections. We need to consider the consequence of this. Um, and we need, to, we need to make sure that on this particular occasion, because of the effect it has on EU citizens um, on the rest of the European Union, I think they should be having a vote. And as a long-term advocate for votes at 16, I think we should make that change too. I actually hope it's a precursor for changes to the franchise across the United Kingdom um, on other elections so far. Um, there has been some resistance, particularly from the Conservative Party, but I hope this is used as a battering ram to get the changes we all strive for in our democracy. But, I mean, we've been in favour, Liberal Democrats, of a referendum if powers were to be ceded to the European Union. But we now accept this referendum is on the way, um, and we need to seize the opportunities to put the case right, the right case for the European Union and Britain's place at the heart of it. Because too often we're timid about the benefits of the European Union, fearing the scepticism that some people hold. So we should be talking about the benefits of our influence in the world as a block of 500 million people. The influence that we can have for good progressive politics across the world. The free movement of people within the continent of Europe. The Final economic minute. single market. The common social and employment standards the efforts that the European Union makes towards tackling climate change. These are the big goals that we can achieve through the European Union referendum debate. We all need to work together to seize that opportunity. Let's put that opportunity before people in Scotland so they understand what the benefit is of being able to go to university in other parts of the continent without your education being disrupted. The fact that you can go to Spain to work for a period of time, and people from Spain can come and work here too. That's shared benefits, making sure that if you've got a business here in Scotland, you can trade with people right across the European Union with as limited number of barriers as possible. These are big benefits that we can bring. That sharing of our common goal, that peace that we all sought for um, so many decades ago, Could and we take please? for granted now. That is something we should work for and work for together. Many thanks. And now call on Alex Johnston. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And could I begin by also thanking all the people in this chamber this afternoon who have taken the opportunity to tell me what I think. The truth is that while free, uh, I still have the freedom to do so under this fairly centralising authoritarian government, I will decide what I think. And what I think is that the Conservative Party actually has an excellent record in terms of its engagement with the European Union. We were not in at the ground floor. We weren't part of the European Steel, uh, Coal and Steel Confederation. We weren't part of the original seven. But we very quickly took the opportunity, once we'd seen the passing of Charles de Gaulle, to get ourselves into that European Union. And, of course, it was a Conservative Prime Minister who was responsible for taking this country in. In fact, there have been many times when certain political parties within this country decided that either a substantial part of their membership or their entire uh, active membership should campaign against their presence in Europe. The Conservative Party is no different, and as we go forward towards this referendum, there will no doubt be Conservatives who campaign against our continued membership of the European Union. But no doubt there will be others in other political parties who will do the same. But let me address for a moment some of the things that have been discussed during the course of this debate. I think there's been the typical move by many to get in right in there and to express themselves in their own terms and their own particular area of interest. 
But I hope I can explain my views in a very simple way that is easy to understand. First of all, what we're talking about is a promise by David Cameron that he will renegotiate the terms of our membership and put it to the British people in a referendum. A referendum in which he will decide, excuse me, not for the moment, a referendum which will be decided by a simple yes or no. We accept these terms or we reject them. The fact that we are discussing the European Union is something we, something, something we, no, not at the moment, something we must not confuse. And suggestions during the course of this debate that this should cover European human rights legislation, ECHR as it's known, uh, is simply conflating two current issues which are not really related in these terms. We've heard a lot said about EU funding and how many projects in the United Kingdom and here in Scotland have benefited from EU funding, but that's something of a red herring given that as one of the few net contributors to Europe, we actually pay for that funding and then some to other countries. When we talk about the importance of our economic connections, our trade with Europe, figures have been skewed in order to prove arguments that cannot be proved. Yes, of that material, that GDP that Scotland produces that is sold outside the United Kingdom, a very high proportion of it goes to Europe. But to achieve that high percentage, we must ignore the fact that the vast majority of our trade in Scotland goes to the rest of the United Kingdom. In fact, our trade with Europe in the year 2012-13, which is the latest figures I have before me, we had £12.9 billion of trade with Europe. We had £46.2 billion of trade with the rest of the United Kingdom. That is an argument to remain part of the United Kingdom. It's also an argument to remain part of the European Union, I might suggest. But there is not one case for EU membership which is not at least a stronger case for continued UK membership, which puts the Scottish National Party in a position which I believe they cannot defend. Let me go on to address a couple of the other issues which have been central to this debate. The issue of the franchise, uh, I think, again, is something of a red herring in this argument because we in Scotland have argued that we should control the franchise for this Parliament, that we should decide who can vote in our election, uh, and we have decided that that will include 16- and 17-year-olds. The Westminster Parliament has told us we can have that power. Is it not, there, therefore, a little ironic that we should then decide how they uh, will control the franchise. I say, I say it is their choice, and if we wish to influence it, we should do so through the means available to us. Let me also address the issue of the double majority, Final as minute. it has been described uh, by, this, uh, by many in the debate. I can remember in 1979 we had a, a referendum in Scotland where there was a 40% rule uh, applied. 40% of the electorate had to vote in a particular direction before we could get a result. That was considered by many at the time to be inappropriate. And that's why during the Scottish referendum we had a, a simple majority as the only test. If we are to have a double majority rule, one which requires all this, the nations within the United Kingdom to vote a particular way in order to achieve an outcome, then I think it introduces a hurdle which the SNP itself will find it has to address once again when it inevitably <laughs> brings back its referendum on Scottish independence. Finally, on the issue of immigration, I believe that Eastern European immigrants are absolutely vital to the economy of the United Kingdom and particularly to Scotland. Must close, but I please. believe it is only fair that if they come here, they should come to a job. And for that reason, I think it is only appropriate that we should take action to prevent so-called benefits tourism. But then Willie Coffey tells us in his speak contribution that that close, doesn't please. happen. So no worries there then.
Thank you. And I now call on Anne McTaggart. Maximum seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And as we've seen for the majority of the tenor of the, today's debate, it is in the interest of Scotland and the broader UK to remain in the EU for many reasons. Although many have indicated the realisation that many changes need to be made, but that it would be easier tackled from within the EU membership. We are right to argue that Britain's exit from the European Union poses huge risks for British jobs, trade and investment. And as mentioned by many speakers, the EU is still by far our biggest export market. Tariff-free access to 500 million customers is hugely important for our businesses. Half of our inward investment comes from the EU. And a significant proportion of the investment from outside the EU is helped by our status as a gateway to the single market. And it is not only about the economics, it is about security and values too. With a proxy war taking place in Ukraine, it makes little sense for Britain to be calling for maximum European unity and sanctions towards Russia and in the next breath threatening to leave the EU. The hard end of our security will continue to be provided by NATO, but we should not underestimate the importance of the shared values of peace, democracy and the peaceful resolution of disputes that are embodied by the EU membership. We in the Labour Party support Britain's membership in the European Union. Our hard-working members of the European Parliament are always at the heart of the decision-making processes in Brussels. The First Minister has argued that the four constituent parts of the UK should each have a veto, also known as the double lock system, in this referendum. However, the majority of the people in all four constituent parts of the UK see it as a decision that should be taken by the population as a whole and not by the separate parts. This was flagged up earlier, presiding officer, um, within a few of the speeches that, that this may well come back um, to haunt us. A survey conducted by researchers at the University of Edinburgh suggests that the majority of people in Scotland, which is 55%, are in favour of the UK deciding on the future of its EU membership as a single political entity. We should recognise Clearly, the proposal for what it is, headline grabbing and issue deflecting. We cannot spend the next two years saying that Scotland's voice isn't being heard, that we aren't being treated with respect by the UK government. The First Minister has suggested that the EU referendum result in which Scotland votes yes and England votes no could trigger demands for a second independence referendum. We duly hope that doesn't happen. We hope that Scotland is not forced to choose between two unions, our union with England, Wales and Northern Ireland and our union with the European partners. And that is why Scottish Labour will spend all our time and energy making the positive case for EU membership for Scotland and for the UK. The argument to stay in the EU will be about far more than what as politicians do in here. It will involve businesses, universities, people at work and people from all walks of life. Hopefully it will include young people. There will be, of course, much debate about the details of the referendum over the coming weeks. We believe that 16 and 17 year olds should be allowed to take part in the EU referendum vote. The picture from Scotland's referendum was clear. 16 and 17 year olds are a sophisticated, nuanced group of voters. They are engaged. They care just as much as those who are older and, as Siobhan McMahon kindly put it, more experienced. They most certainly deserve to be a full participant. We in the Labour Party are also committed to let EU citizens vote in this referendum. EU citizens who have decided to make the UK their home, who live here, work here, raise families here and pay taxes here, should be given the opportunity to vote on a matter of huge significance for the future. 
To conclude, presiding officer, we will make a positive progressive case for continued membership during the referendum while advocating constructive reform of the EU from within the existing treaty framework as strong and as of active members. The notion of a double lock for the four parts of the UK might serve as a good headline, but it generally is not supported by people across the UK and it is a poor substitute for a genuine statement of aims. Labour are committed to do all that we can to ensure young people and EU citizens are allowed to vote in this referendum. I therefore fully support the amendment lodged by my colleague Claire Baker today. Thank you. And I now call on Hamza Youssef to wind up nine <coughs> minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I want to start by adding the Scottish Government's uh, uh, voice to that of Willie Rennie's when he spoke about his um, uh, late colleague, uh, Charles Kennedy. I shared a platform uh, with Willie Rennie over the weekend at the Pakistan Welfare Trust, and he described Charles Kennedy as having that, that gentle voice uh, of, of reason. I think I would have, all of us would have liked to have heard that gentle voice uh, perhaps once more during this uh, campaign that is going to be coming in the next few weeks and months. I think generally, presiding officer, the debate has been very good, uh, excellent contributions. I didn't mean to sound so surprised when I said that, but it has been excellent, actually, uh, around this chamber on the benefits uh, of the European Union and what that brings to, to Scotland. Many people have spoken about the business benefits, the economic benefits, the academic benefits, uh, the social benefits, uh, the democratic benefits. Uh, but I thought Malcolm Chisholm was, was exceptionally good in saying that um, the facts and figures will only get you so far, uh, but the debate uh, requires passion, uh, requires emotion, uh, which is quite uh, interesting because during the independence referendum, we were often told that we should be looking at the debate from a rational uh, prism, a logical prism, and that emotion uh, should be discarded. But nonetheless, I agree with what uh, Malcolm Chisholm had to say. Uh, for those that believe in the European Union, the campaign, uh, I think we are agreed, has to be positive. Uh, although there, of course, would be risks to leaving the European Union in terms of the jobs that have been highlighted uh, and the facts and the figures that have been mentioned, I think we wouldn't do the campaign justice if we didn't talk about the positives that a reformed uh, European Union could achieve and already does, of course, achieve for the citizens of Scotland and, of course, the United Kingdom uh, as a whole. And just as a side point, too, I think uh, the campaign, you know, uh, my opinion is that it shouldn't be necessarily led from the front by politicians or indeed by big businesses, uh, because that could often uh, put people off too. Uh, Jamie McGregor was absolutely correct in his opening uh, statement to say that it's uh, healthy uh, for us to question, to criticise, to analyse our relationship with the European Union. I've not heard a single member here say uh, that, uh, our, that the European Union is perfect. Uh, far from it. Everybody believes that the European Union uh, requires reform. The Scottish Government has produced a 20-page document which he is well versed on uh, I know from sitting in committee, uh, being questioned by him uh, on our reform agenda. And on top of that, further detail was added by the First Minister during her recent visit uh, to Brussels, where she spoke about uh, giving member states more autonomy when it comes to social and public health issues, uh, quoting, of course, the example of minimum, minimum unit pricing uh, for alcohol. She talked about better regulation as opposed to more regulation. She, record, she spoke about uh, how reform uh, can work for those who live in Scotland, and Dave Stewart quite rightly mentioned uh, the, the reforms to, to the common fisheries uh, policy. She also spoke about tackling issues, issues that matter uh, socially uh, to the people and the citizens of Europe. Youth unemployment, the scourge of youth unemployment, far too high uh, across the continent uh, and other such issues. What I haven't uh, heard from the Conservatives during their uh, speeches, but of course I'll listen as, in the weeks and the months that go on, is what reform they believe requires treaty change and what parts of the treaty need changed. Uh, because that, is, that information is not forthcoming, yet we have senior Conservative ministers, in fact the Prime Minister himself, saying that he believes treaty change is required. Uh, that is without going into the various difficulties that treaty change uh, would impose from referendums in many countries, including Ireland, uh, to indeed even the pragmatic politics of trying to ratify any treaty change in perhaps a, a parliament like Greek, Greece's parliament at this present moment. Of course, I'll take an intervention. Um, would the minister agree that travelling down to Strasbourg every three weeks would require, would require or not travelling down, would require treaty change? Minister. Uh, 
No, OK. Uh, that's his, uh, if that is his fundamental point, that is why he wants uh, a treaty change and why he believes that uh, we need a uh, reform uh, with our relationship with the European Union, then uh, perhaps I have uh, missed the point. Uh, not at the moment. I'm going to make some progress, but I will address this point that he made uh, earlier on in his intervention to the Cabinet Secretary. I think Willie Rennie, uh, Malcolm Chisholm, Claire Baker and others talked about internationalisation and why they feel Europe is so important from their perspective. We too on these uh, in these seats in this part of the chamber also are internationalists. It's why uh, we believe that if you work in cooperation uh, across the European Union, we can achieve great results. Peacetime uh, was mentioned by Stuart Maxwell, uh, reflected on by Willie Rennie, I thought very, very well. Uh, climate change was spoken about uh, too, but it's also important for some of the big challenges we face as a continent. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has played a leading role uh, in regards to the refugee crisis that we see uh, in, in, uh, for refugees crossing uh, the Mediterranean from North Africa uh, into the European uh, Union. Uh, there has been a suggestion of how to tackle that problem, resettlement being part of that. The Scottish Government very much believes that resettlement has to be part of the solution, as well as, of course, uh, tackling it from the source. Talking of reform, let me just spend a minute also discussing uh, that issue, which I think has dominated uh, contributions from the Chamber, which is reform to the actual franchise uh, of the vote. Members from across the Parliament have spoken very well uh, on uh, the why 16 and 17-year-olds must uh, be uh, given the vote in the EU referendum. Uh, Claire uh, Baker spoke of it very well, I thought, to Malcolm Chisholm, uh, to uh, Christina McKelvey, Stuart Maxwell. In fact, many of them spoke of their own uh, experiences during the referendum uh, campaign, the independence referendum campaign, going into high schools and being asked very tough, uh, very difficult questions. And I would say 16, 17 year olds were the primary success uh, of the Scottish uh, referendum. Uh, EU citizens. Uh, as well. Actually, on that, on that point of 16 and 17 years, I must say, when Alex Johnson was making his point, uh, he said uh, we should try to influence uh, the, the Westminster and the UK government through the means that are available to us. Well, we did. We just did. And uh, we had a general election and 56 out of 59 MPs, uh, of course, were uh, elected on the mandate that uh, we believe that 16 and 17 year olds should be given the vote here in Scotland. And of course, 16 and 17 year olds will not be given the vote. Uh, even though we have that mandate in Scotland. In terms of EU citizens, uh, I don't really need to add too much more because Christian Allard, uh, as well as others, but Christian Allard in particular made that point uh, so well, uh, so passionately, uh, so strongly, uh, I believe. Uh, I think it is for a party, the Conservative Party, that prides itself on being a party, they often say, of logic and of reason. I've never heard of such nonsensical, unfair, ludicrous uh, rules of electoral engagement in all my days. Uh, the UK government uh, proposals for EU referendum uh, will, they, will disenfranchise people who have chosen to make Scotland their home and the United Kingdom their home, not for years, but for decades and decades. And anybody listening to Christian uh, Allard's statement will see that he is somebody who has made Scotland his home. Uh, his family have made their home here uh, in Scotland. People come to Christian Allard for help, for assistance in his role as a member of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, they require... Uh, his help and he does his duty towards them and yet he has been completely and utterly disenfranchised. If the Conservatives said no foreign national would be allowed to vote, I would still be against it of course, but I would understand the consistency and the logic, but it's not the case. They give the vote of course to some foreign nationals uh, but not to others. Uh, those from the Commonwealth which include European countries, two European countries and lump of course Ireland onto that as well, as well as giving expats and uh, others uh, the votes too, who have not contributed to this country perhaps for up to 15 years, but disenfranchising those that have simply because of the colour of their passport. Yes. Alex Johnson. Is the minister trying, is the minister, is the minister trying to give the impression that there is some <laughs> devious uh, thought process afoot here? Uh, or will he simply acknowledge that the franchise will be granted to exactly the same people who were entitled to vote on the 7th of May? Well, for, for, first of all, it's not the exact same people uh, that were allowed to vote on the 7th of May. Lords being an example that Stuart Stevenson made uh, very, very well. I don't think there's any devious thought process. I just think there isn't a thought process uh, when it comes to the franchise that has been made. How can it be any thought uh, when somebody from Fiji can vote, but somebody from France can't, somebody from the Solomon Islands can 
but somebody from Spain uh, can't. Uh, David Stewart and others also talked about the benefits that migrants and EU migrants have brought. In particular, many people quoted the UCL study, uh, that £20 billion figure over the last decade uh, in terms of the contribution that EU citizens have made. He also asked me specifically uh, about the, the post-study work visa, which wouldn't affect the EU migrants, but those out with. And I'm pleased to say if we saw over the weekend, we have a cross-party steering group, which Claire Baker will be sitting on to take this uh, issue forward. Now, other parties have spoken extensively about the double lock, and I would reassure Mr. 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 Rainey, that um, we're not pessimistic on these benches. In fact, if anything, we are told far too often that we are increasingly uh, uh, optimistic. And I would say that we are, and it's true, we, we are very optimistic. I believe that, as he does, that the people of the United Kingdom uh, hopefully will vote uh, a yes vote to stay within the European Union. I would say we wouldn't be doing our job as a government if we weren't prudent and protecting Scots and Scottish citizens. Uh, if I have time, I will take an intervention. Mr. Rainey, briefly. If he's so optimistic, why doesn't he just drop the double lock proposals? Because they're no longer needed. Minister. That's exactly what I've just said. We wouldn't be doing our job as a government if we didn't take every single measure to protect the people of Scotland. It's not just us. Uh, Carwin Jones, uh, First Minister of Wales, Labour First Minister of Wales, uh, on his recent visit to Scotland said, any decision to leave the EU taken against the wishes of the people of Wales or Scotland would be unacceptable and steps must be taken to ensure this does not happen. So, you need to close, uh, I, Minister. So uh, I have to close. And I accept, of course, that uh, we can have a debate about what those steps uh, may well be. But uh, I would say the double lock is a very sensible uh, proposition. So uh, I think the debate has been very, very good, uh, Presiding Officer. I think it's been positive. But we should ensure that in the weeks and the months to come, uh, as Malcolm Chisholm said, that there's emotion, that there's passion. But undoubtedly, the, the united voice of this parliament should be that Scotland and the United Kingdom is stronger for being in the European Union, and the European Union is stronger for having the United Kingdom and Scotland as part of it. Thank you. Thank you. That ends the debate on the EU referendum. The next item of business is a statement by Aileen McLeod on the publication of the 2013.